All right, I think we're live. Hopefully some people come in and confirm that. Uh, anyway, do my little intro. It is me, look, with a lower third, Bobby Fiorentino from the BoardGameClub.com, Facebook group, you know, you know where to find me. And uh, I, I don't think, James, I don't think you could actually see me. Uh, you can't see what I'm, the fancy stuff I'm doing on screen. No, I can't see anything. I get to see you. But uh, yeah, I got James Daly from Tin Robot Games. Let me oh, pull him in here. What's up, James? And um, and we're going to do a little inter- interview here. So this is our second round. We talked before your campaign, or during your campaign, I think, right? During the early games? Yeah, I think we were like week days. one, maybe near the halfway through the second week uh, that we cool. connected. And- I guess I'll, I'll give it to you. Um, you can talk about your game and your campaign and, and pretty, much, uh, pretty much where you're at. And what happened, and uh, and then we'll get into it. I got questions. I know you've got some tips and stuff. So yeah, uh, yeah. Tell us about great. your campaign. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, this game is a disaster. Maybe near the end, uh, getting up. To yes, the- everybody would be great uh, as well. I've been following along, and uh, I can't wait. I can't wait till that uh, that launches. So um, yeah, so we finished our campaign. Um, we uh, squeaked over the finish line. Uh, ended up. Um, hitting just over 10,000 and uh, we were uh, 10 different countries uh, had uh, a pledge behind the game. Nice. We've that's 10,000 Canadian, right? Yeah. 10,000 Canadian. Yeah. So that's right. like what, like 5,000 $40 us. Yeah. $10. Yeah. It's about 7,500, I think actually, but um, yeah. So 10 countries, which is pretty cool to, uh, to see this game around the world. Um, and, uh, and we literally just finished. And I was kind of holding off uh, us doing this, this kind of round two, because I want to make sure that, uh, I finished the the fulfillment because uh, there's always learnings you have there, and uh, yeah, I bet if anybody else is uh, in the same spot and might be going through kind of what I went through, any kind of advice I can offer is always is always uh, is always helpful. And quite frankly, what I would have liked to have uh, before I started. Um, I think the uh, the campaign uh, went uh, went fairly well. Um, the there's obviously a lot of learnings along the way. The one thing I would say to anybody uh, who's going through this process right now and what you're going through with your own game is preparation is, is, is paramount. Building that community ahead of time is paramount. Um, we would have done a lot better had we built that community up uh, more robustly before launching. Uh, timing. So, so let, me, let me ask you about that because I, I came into your campaign a little late, uh, you know, definitely after you had uh, started and um, so I'm not familiar with where what you did beforehand um, in terms of building a community. I'm sure you did some sort of advertising or something. But in terms of like a place for people to like gather and, and discuss and get excited, what, what did you do for that? Yeah, so coming from more of a, uh, a, tr- a traditional marketing background, the focus was on news releases, uh, reaching out to uh, uh, PR contacts, reaching out to uh, several different blogs and, and, and websites. And what I found was um, some of the key things that I kind of latched on, what you've just done this past week is, is offering to get people to test, uh, test the game. We had our own inner circle of people that tried this game to death and played this quite a bit. So we knew it was uh, a very playable game. We've been playing it for 20 years. Um, but really having uh, you know a broader group of people, especially so you've got reviews that then you can then use on your Kickstarter page and use promote to those people's audience uh, uh, the game as well. That's something we didn't really get into until going into the Kickstarter campaign. I should have started that six months uh, before. Um, we dumped a lot so, of money into – sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about uh, reviews. How many reviews did you do, and did you pay for them, and did you find that they were worthwhile? Sorry to interrupt your flow, but this right. I got I got very like nitty gritty kind of questions yeah, because we, I'm going through it now. I dumped a lot of money into uh, Facebook advertising, Twitter advertising, YouTube advertising. Um, the actual reviews we had, I think, it ended up being like eight that we ended up putting on our Kickstarter page. Um, our our goal, and I would say this to Quite frankly, anybody don't pay for uh, for reviews. Um, there's a lot of people. You, you think that's more of like uh, if you have like a big launch, like like let's say if you have um, let's say if you have a game that you know is going to be successful, like let's say Gloomhaven's having a spinoff or something like that. Right. You think then it makes sense when you know it's going to be a monster campaign, mm-hmm. and so it justifies the price at that point. Would you say that's the case, but not so much for smaller first time games? I think there's two different things. So I want to split this into two pieces. One is 
if you go to like a um, like the board game reviewers uh, uh, Facebook page, right? So on there, right? If somebody gave me this tip. You can you can post or you can say, hey, you know, I've got uh, either a print and play version of my game or I have actual copies of my game. Looking for reviewers. Here's a description of of the game. Um, people will pipe in and say, hey, I'd love to I'd love to review it. In, in that case, you'll have some people that say, hey, I would love to review or even reach out to a lot of the bloggers I reached out to said, yeah, we'll review this, but there's a fee, right? So we'll, we'll give you a review, but you know, here's kind of our, 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 our price list of what's going to cost for us to review your game. No guarantees that we're going to give you a positive review, but we'll review your game. We'll give you a link on our website. I found that um, I had more authentic reviews and better feedback when I wasn't paying. So, politely said thanks, but no thanks for, uh, or thanks, but no thanks. Pun intended. Pun intended, yeah. <laughs> uh, for some of the people that were looking for, for paid um, mm. and focused on people that just said, hey, if you can get a game to me, I'll review it. There's enough people out there now that are more than willing to give you a, a review. You invest the money of sending them a copy of the game, right? Uh, print and play, or, or a physical copy of the game, uh, which we did. And, um, and in return, what they'll do is they'll do a review of the game. Some will be positive, some might not be positive. I had one where the person said, you know what? I can see how some people enjoy this game. This game's not for me. Um, you're going to get that. Every That's the great thing about board gaming ecosystem is there's so many different games, so many different play styles. Um, there's something really for everybody. And, and there's also not a chance that every game is going to be loved by everybody. It's not going to happen. So... Um, and I appreciate the feedback, and, and, and I think the key is always to be humble and thank people for giving their feedback and giving the time. It takes time for somebody to open up the box and go through it to put together a video. Like it, it, you do videos all the time, it's not um, it's not like it takes seconds. It looks it takes a lot longer than it looks on when you're watching a video, right? Right. You got to edit. You got to yeah. even just like playing a game. You got to get people together. You got to set up. You got to yeah. set time aside. Put your kids to bed. Like I just did. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny. Anyone who's watching content creators, they, they don't realize how much goes into it. Oh, it's a ton. Uh, yeah, it's a ton. So, so reviewers, you say, don't pay, at least not for a first-time campaign. That You think that the money that you spent was more or less not, not useful. You could have used it somewhere else better? Well, I didn't pay for any reviewers. And, um, but oh, I did, yeah. um, what, I, what I wish I had done was uh, we had something like 20 copies, advanced copies of the game uh, for people to test I should have done 50, 60 copies of the game and just fired them out to different people. Just mail them. Hmm. Say, here's a copy of the game. It's a, uh, it's a first run off the press. It's 99.9% .9 of what the game is going to look like when it's in its finished state with something tangible that they can actually feel, touch, and work with. Uh, I, would have, I would have channeled more funds into that because I think that got me a lot more legs, each of those reviews, than going and either buying banner ads on a, on a gaming website or um, you know, spending money on... Um, which I never did, but someone that would say, "Hey, pay, pay me, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll review your, your game." Review. Yeah. So I think. Um, yeah. I was just gonna say welcome to John and Raja Rock, Raha Rock, uh, who jumped in, and anyone else I can't see right now. But if anyone has any questions for James, just feel free to throw it in the chat. Uh, so how much, how much were your review copies? Uh, like, how much did they cost you to make your prototypes, or uh, I, I guess not prototypes, but review copies that that you then would mail out to people? Well, there's two things. So uh, print and play doesn't really cost anything but time. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, and I was, I was pleased that there were a number of people that were willing to do the, the print and play. Um, you'll go through this with the card game, as you know, uh, having people, yeah, it'll be a little there, easier. Hundred some odd cards, cut them out, put them into sleeves. Like, it's a lot of work as well. Right. So uh, anybody's willing to do that. Uh, it's, it's always a good day. Um, for the actual board game, I think the cost ended up being like, I think it was like 50 bucks. A, it was like retail. So, Oh really? So yeah. if you sent out like 20 of them, that's like, yeah, you know, good, good amount of money there. It's an investment. Yeah. yeah. Now you have some people that will, uh, they will take it on loan too. Right. So I had a number of people saying, Hey, send me the game. And then as long as you send me, uh, like, uh, like a mail, like a courier pickup tag, I'll then football it over or whoever else you need to, to review it after me. So Right. That's a good idea. That's an option as well. I'm sure if I did more, uh, the cost would have come down. But um, we weren't we weren't doing like low concepts uh, prototypes. Like these were pretty much the actual game. 
Um, so when we had our manufacturing set up and we, we, we manufactured in China, and if anybody has any questions on that, I can, I can talk about that. There's lots of learnings as well. Um, we, uh, you know, once we got to a point where we thought we were there, then we said, hey, look, you know, we're already committed with this, uh, with this manufacturer. Here's what we're trying to do. We need to get some review copies out. What's the price for you to go and hand make, you know, a small batch of these? Um, so, yeah, it was... Um, it was a bit of investment. Maybe it's thirty dollars. It didn't uh, fifty might sound a little high, um, but still, you're gonna pay close to retail. Same with even cards. Um, I sent you a link before um, before this uh, making cards. Or making yeah, it's play called uh, MakePlayCards.com. I just found this uh, recently, and um, I have a card game I'm working on, and um, not really wanting to sleeve this game. I want to actually have the physical cards. Like I want to actually get an actual deck. To, that's as close as possible to what the finished thing will look like. Often mm -hmm. you get a lot of learnings of it. We had this with the tanks game as well. When we had the physical game, you know, one thing we noticed is that the pockets were not deep enough to put the cards in. So people like to sleeve their cards. Well, if anybody sleeved the cards uh, that we include with the game, you know, they wouldn't fit properly in the tray. So we end up having that tray adjusted at the last minute to go as deep as possible so that if people sleeve their cards, they fit comfortably in the, in the tray. Um, same with the pieces to hold the flags, and the tanks, we went up with a larger tank. So, you know, these are little tweaks that you don't really, um, happen upon until you actually have a physical sample in front of you. So, um, deck of cards, you're looking at about 30 bucks a deck, uh, but you can print literally one deck Jeez. at a time. You upload your picture yeah. and you're getting, uh, you know, you're getting cards that are, there's an example of some cards that are actual cards, right? Linen finish and so forth. Um, but you're paying $30, but now when we had, uh, we had, we ordered one deck, looked at it, we said, ooh, there's some things we need to change. We never would have noticed if we hadn't had a physical deck in front of us. So we've made some changes and now. So that's one way you can try to um, at least mitigate some of the errors you're gonna have later on down the road uh, in your manufacturing. Um, on the manufacturing uh, note, one thing I would say is when dealing with uh, Chinese manufacturers, uh, a lot of people are, um, I've come across a lot of people who seem uh, anxious about that. That, you know, well, you know, are you going to get good quality or is it going to be trusting or is it going to work? And I think for most of the companies that do uh, gaming now in China, and there, there's a number of them, they're all very trustworthy. I mean, I have, you, you use uh, Panda? No, no, we, we, we source direct. So, um, yeah, direct, direct to the manufacturer. So Panda, I think, is through uh, West Coast here. Uh, and then they are affiliated with uh, their their uh, – manufacturing location in Shenzhen or whatever their location is. Um, but you have all the actual manufacturing facilities in China. Some are experts in doing boards. Others are experts in doing cars. So it's, it's kind of finding the right one. Um, but it, it, it worked out quite well. I mean, you have to expect you're going to have to pay by the time they release your good. You have to pay everything up front before they'll release the goods. Um, but the one caution I would have is to make sure you're doing your quality control during uh, along the way. One thing we had on the tanks games, we had some, uh, some pledges that, uh, people were trying to get for Christmas, right. And times for a Christmas present. And we were literally, um, going to manufacture about a week before Christmas started. So we had them flown over. There was about 10 of them. And, uh, when we got, actually had 30 games flown over, excuse me. So of course, when I got them, I'm going to open one up and take a look at it. So open it up. Yeah. First thing I noticed is I'm doing my unboxing and I had, I had the best poker face when I was doing that unboxing video because you couldn't tell the shock in my face. But instead of having six of each tank, uh, there was three in the box. Right. You, can't, you can't play. <laughs> you can't play with that number of tanks. The wrong number of tanks. The box is six right around the back. So I was like, whoa. So I had to open up all the, all the boxes, take tanks from some games, put them into the others, contact the manufacturer and said, hey um, – you know, big problem here. You're going, we're going to the, our, our full production run. This doesn't have the right number of tanks in it. So they went investigated. They were able to find, it was a communication error between departments. Lots of pictures were sent to us from when they started the run, the first couple that came off the, the large run so that we can see the items and make sure it's babysat. So I would encourage anybody that's manufacturing overseas. It's going to cost you a little bit to have something shipped uh, as a, as, as kind of a, a first couple units off to take a look at, but you will save yourself a lot of headaches uh, by doing yeah. that. Uh, Timing is another one. We ran right into the Chinese New Year. Uh, so we ran our campaign in October, mid-October. If Thinkify is to run this campaign again, I probably would do it in the summertime. 
uh, for two reasons. One, so that the, the, the games are comfortably in our hands in time for Christmas. So people that want to pledge and make this a Christmas present, they have a, a very good chance, 99% chance that they're going to get the game before Christmas. Um, but secondly, it, you, you're going to, you want to make sure that manufacturer run, it comes out uh, before, uh, before Chinese New Year. It actually lands in North America before Chinese New Year. We found that our manufacturing run finished the week before Chinese New Year started and the country literally shuts down for yeah. a month. And so we couldn't, even though the games were done, we couldn't get them onto a container because everyone's rushing to get these onto containers uh, before, they, um, uh, before the New Year kicks in. So our games didn't get on the containers before, before the, the New Year. Uh, one did, the one coming to North America, the one going to the UK to make it on in time. So we lost four weeks for all of our fulfillment outside of North America, just based on the Chinese New Year. Um, so that was one thing that for sure I will avoid like a, uh, like a, like the plague next time we do one of these. We'll yeah. make sure we adjust our timing probably at least six months uh, earlier. So for fulfillment, did you use mm -hmm. uh, a fulfillment company or how did you handle that? And if you did, which one? Um, short answer is yes. Uh, I used three of them. So I used uh, in the United States uh, Quartermaster. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Canada, I use Snakes and Lattes. They're also a game cafe, but they have to do Kickstarter fulfillment. There's uh, several companies in Canada that do uh, Kickstarter fulfillment. I use Snakes and Lattes for two specific reasons. You know, I'll get to that in a second. I use Game Quest in the US in the, in the UK. Um, there was another um, company I was looking at in Australia that I was going to use, but based on the number of pledges I had, it was only a handful in Australia, New Zealand. So um, I think it worked out to be like $2 more in shipping to just ship it from the UK uh, versus shipping in going through all the uh, customs hassle because there's specific things you have to do for uh, Australia specifically in terms of plastic pallets and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't worth the headache. So I did the rest of the world's fulfillment out of the UK. Um, Snakes and Lattes I picked in Canada because they act almost like a sister company with uh, quartermaster logistics so those two companies if you need to send inventory between the two it's very easy they have customs brokers on their team that can help with the flow of goods um so i took advantage of that um the actual shipping from uh china to uh we end up going to canada first and then shipping from canada down to the states we had the option through quartermaster to have it shipped into uh, the united states and then take the inventory from canada and ship that up up north um my advice actually oh. to people would be if you want to save a ton of money sorry oh no it just it just cut out right when yeah, you're about glitched. to give your great advice <laughs> you're like my advice it's going to make you one million dollars is uh, 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 and also we go black yeah all right so go ahead well, what's, your, what's your super advice That's yeah it. so um yeah so my advice would be um f get do the do the shipping yourself from china to to north america if do the you, shipping yourself from China to North America, what does that mean? From China, what do you mean? All right, <laughs> okay. so my product is made in, in, in China, right? Made, right. So I have, it's a fairly large game, so there is two pallets of product, full pallets that had to come on ocean container, cross the ocean to get in North America before we can even fulfill, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to get the product from your manufacturing facility to the fulfillment centers. The fulfillment centers offer a service where they will take care of that for you. So it, it makes it easy. The problem or the opportunity, I guess, there is that um, they, they have quite an upcharge when they do that. And if you use your if you use a freight forwarder, right? So you will talk to a freight forwarder and arrange that shipping yourself without getting the fulfillment centers to do it, you'll save a lot of money. I end up saving seven hundred dollars uh, for North America shipments. Uh, just by uh, using my own freight forwarder uh, versus using the one that uh, that they were offering. And so the freight forwarder is handles. So you didn't handle it yourself. You still had someone else do it. You just didn't have the fulfillment company do it. Right. And the freight forwarder is in charge of getting the goods from the manufacturer in China to the fulfillment company. That's correct. And then you'll have a customs broker that will then uh, do all your paperwork to clear clear customs. Right. So and is that is that uh, another separate person or do they work uh, with it can be uh, some forwarding companies have their own customs brokers built in uh, the one I used in Canada um, integrated carriers. I'll do a little plug. Uh, they have they have a customs broker. So you pay like 50 bucks and then the customs broker takes care of all your, your paperwork coming into Canada. 
Um, if I wanted to ship it to the States, I would then need to have whoever's receiving it, have their customs broker clear it, right? So whoever's clearing it has to be the one that's uh, got an account with that customs broker. Man, there's just so many steps in the supply chain. Yeah. It's insane. If anybody wants to message me afterwards and it's going through this and says, hey, can you walk me through this? Can you help link me into people that can help me with this? Absolutely. I'm more than happy to Sure. Pass I'll, I'll post your uh, personal cell phone number in the comments after this so that everyone can get in touch with you <laughs> at all hours of the night. Media, uh, <laughs> media at uh, tinrobotgames.com. Media at tinrobotgames.com. You can email me. Uh, or just send me uh, a, a message through uh, through Facebook. I'd be more than happy to uh, to help. But yeah, there's substantial savings uh, when you do that. So because um, all they're doing is they're just they're just using a customs broker, right? So they're going to go and they're going to use a freight forwarding company. They're going to use a customs broker, but it's not their customs broker. It's not their freight forwarding company. They're outsourcing, but they're adding an upcharge. So mm-hmm. there could be some pretty significant savings. My my regret is I didn't do the same thing for the UK. And I probably could have saved money if I had arranged the shipment from Snakes and Lattes down to Quartermaster. I could probably have cut that that cost in half. Um, I ended up paying, I think it was like three hundred dollars to to do that. I p- could have probably done that for like one hundred fifty to two hundred dollars. Right. So so between uh, all of them, it, it could it. potentially save someone you know thousand dollars, thousands of dollars. Um, you know where margins aren't particularly great, so any sort of savings. It's a pretty big deal. So these are good tips. Yeah. Um, so so with the people don't often then, think about the. Sorry, go ahead. You're just chopping up a little bit, so I apologize. Oh, sorry. So well, first I want to know. So how many units did you get from China? How many backers did you have, and then how many <clears> units? Because I know most manufacturers have a minimum of five hundred, a thousand, yeah, in increments of five hundred. So yeah, most do most do. Um, uh, 500, uh, 500 is kind of the, the minimum. We did a thousand. Um, so between all of our backers, um, on Kickstarter, as well as people we've sold to off outside of Kickstarter, uh, we've gone through roughly about 220 of those. Um, and that's covered off pretty much the cost of our, of our manufacturing. So, oh, okay. pretty- so, so pretty much you, your profits all, and this may be the case everywhere, but your profits like backloaded to now. Yeah. Like yeah. Everything you buy now, there is no more unit cost. It's just right. all gravy. Yeah. Minus like shipping, that sort of thing. So, yeah. So we are, we are pretty much break even. Um, and then, so you're, you're still going to have shipping costs, pick pack costs uh, when you, when you ship things out. If you have it in uh, Amazon, for instance, for instance, there's an Amazon, you know, um, a referral fee and so forth, but it's still, pretty much profit going forward. So uh, unlike food, it doesn't expire. So, you know, we're, yeah. we're, we're fine. We're fine with having inventory. And um, part of the exercise we're going through now is reaching out to some of these chains to see if, if, if we can get some larger chains to carry it. Right. So I'm trying to break through to some of the, um, you know, the, the companies, there's one here in Canada called Scholar's Choice, um, you know, different companies, uh, different um, chains that deal with, educational games, board games, and so forth. And that could even include, um, you know, the Walmarts of the world and so forth. So, um, you know, that's that's the phase we're getting into right now. In addition to that, we are connecting in with um, actual um, gaming distributors. So a little shout out to uh, to Mike McRae from Analog Studios. He's uh, been connecting me to some, uh, to some distributors. So I really appreciate that. Mike, thank you. Um, so that's kind of the, the hard work for me, I think is, is now going forward. Right. So now to, to reap kind of the, the harvest <laughs> of everything we've planted to this point. Right. You've done the, uh, the heavy lifting. Um, so what, what was behind your decision to go? Cause you could have done 500 units. Instead you went with a thousand, a thousand is more to sell, but I'm assuming a, a better u- a better per unit cost. Yeah. Right? That, that's what I'm noticing that the cost to do, uh, let's say 200 units, it's like almost the same cost to get like a thousand units. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like on the one hand, it's like, why not? But then on the other hand, it, there's like storage and what do you do with all this stuff? So what, what was the thought process behind going with a thousand for you? <laughs> yeah, we, um, well, there's a couple of things. I think the, the thousand was the, 
you have your fixed costs, you're going to, you're going to prorate over a larger number of units, right? So then your overall per unit cost goes down. So for instance, our tanks, right? So we went with the bigger tank. This is a custom mold. So the cost of that mold um, is now spread over more units. So our, our per unit cost uh, went down significantly. We, from our projections, knew we would probably get close to break even worst case on this. Um, at a thousand units, and you know, if if I had it gone the other way, then I would have had been sitting on probably you know 250 units instead of 600 units that I can sell, right? So uh, for us, it was uh, it made the most sense to uh, go with a thousand. So when you say break even at a thousand, you mean for all your other costs like artwork and uh, marketing and mold and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, so I, I include in that uh, manufacturing and uh, and shipping, getting it, manufacturing, shipping, and fulfillment. Those are the three things I put in that. Um, the uh, the time is not not covered in that. So the artwork, right. uh, you know, I did the artwork, right? So there's no, I didn't charge myself to do the artwork. Um, molds was was included in that. What wasn't included in that was any of the advertising we did. Uh, so a lot of the social media advertising and so forth. So that. Uh, if you include that, then yeah, still uh, still in the red, um, but won't take. A and step. that's and that's if you go through all one thousand units. Sorry, I don't understand the question. What do you mean? So you said that at a thousand units, you would break even. Are you saying if you sorry. sell a thousand? <laughs> no. Because that's why I'm like. Yeah, yeah, oh, sorry. Man. So we knew where's the profit? Yeah, yeah, sorry. We knew the per unit cost mm -hmm. um, that we would make at a thousand units if we hit our, our Kickstarter target of ten thousand. Mm -hmm. that covered off the manufacturing for the thousand units plus the fulfillment of the, you know, hundred and some odd uh, units that went out plus all the individual people we've been selling to since. Um, all of that, we we're break even and still then left with 600 units. Yeah, 600 or however units we could then sell um, and, and recoup profits. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Cause um, this was something that, uh, I was talking with somebody else in, uh, in, in one of the groups, uh, one of the game design groups. And it was that if you think that you're, uh, you know, if you, let's say, have a, a minimum print run of 500, right? And let's say you have a $10 game. Simple math says, okay, like if I have 500 units, then I need 500 backers. And uh, so my goal should be uh, 5,000 five thousand dollars should be my goal but it's not because really you right. want to take your unit cost and then multiply that by like if it's a three dollars per let's say five dollars per unit then really your goal should be to break even to to basically get to five dollars times 500 so your goal should be like 2500 if it's hard to like do math while just talking without it written yeah. out but basically like your whatever your fixed costs are you should just look to cover that with the campaign. So you break even yeah. your minimum just to keep the goal down because it seems like everyone wants to keep the goal down to get it hit sooner so that people don't want, because people don't want to fund something that they don't know whether or not it's going to actually fund. Right. They don't want to back that. That seems to be. Yeah. A, so unless you've got like a huge social media engine behind you, which some of these companies do clearly. God, I'm just going to plug my laptop in. Yeah, keep sure. going. Um, I'm not on screen right now, so that I can okay, yeah, plug so that, this in. That, that's exactly it. You're going to have um, – my philosophy is cover, your, cover your, your costs, your fixed costs, your manufacturing costs. What you estimate you're going to be paying in VAT tax uh, as well as uh, as well as well shipping the product to North America. Um, there are some people that I think some of the ones you see fail are people that are getting greedy. They're just like, wow, think of all the money we're going to make. And they're focused more on how much money they could make versus necessarily just covering off – um, you know, their, their investment. I think if you can cover off your investment, if you have games left over, yes, there's going to be storage costs and so forth, depending on what it is. I mean, a card game, your storage cost is going to be very minimal because they're very small little boxes that can uh, be stored. Um, but yeah, that was our, that was my goal was to cover off the costs, make sure so that. Where, so where, where are you warehousing your, your games? Do you have them yourself at your house? Do you have them somewhere or do you have them at like a, a fulfillment center? The classic uh, garage full of games. That's what you got? These games in here. No, uh, we have um, 
Uh, so the cool thing is uh, I have some inventory stored at uh, Quartermaster in the States and uh, you can continue to store uh, there. You pay a monthly uh, fee, things like $25 per pallet. So it's not, uh, it's not a, a crazy amount. Uh, same thing with uh, Game Quest in the UK. I've got games stored there. Again, same thing, you just pay a monthly storage fee. Uh, in Canada, they're currently at Snakes and Lattes. Uh, Snakes and Lattes, I heard recently, is getting out of um, fulfillment or getting out of distribution outside of fulfillment. I don't know if that's true or not. That's a rumor I just recently heard. Um, but thankfully, I'm, I'm local here. So if, if that's the case, I need to store them somewhere else. We know of at least three or four other places that we can, uh, we can store them. Um, there, there's always pick and pack uh, facilities that you can usually find. And I would encourage people to just Google in your area, pick and pack. Um, you will find tons of different warehouses. It doesn't have to be games, right? Anybody can store, um, as long as the warehouse that does storage and they, they charge their nominal fee to have a little, little spot in their warehouse. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be a games distributor to store your games. If you just need to park them somewhere, you can do that. And then most of these pick and pack facilities will help arrange shipments from that location to wherever you need to ship it to. And so, so now you have this, this inventory, right? Mm -hmm. And this was always your plan. So you weren't like surprised, like left with a bunch of inventory. So you're prepared for it. Uh, what do you do with it now? Like how, how do you get the word out about it? Uh, if someone, if, if let's say someone watching this, like, uh, Chris Goodlett, who just commented quartermaster is great. Their shipping is great. When I got a Kickstarter game and well packaged. So let's say Chris Goodlett wants These to. These guys are all, and I give a shout out to all three of the distribution companies: Quartermaster, Games Quest, and um, and uh, Snakes and Lattes. Snakes and Lattes. They all take the actual packing of the game very, very seriously. Um, and so when you first set up, they'll actually send you pictures. We've done a test pack. So here's our box, and here's how we're going to pack your game in there, and here's some pictures, and here's all the bubble around it to make sure the game is protected. Are you okay with that? Is there enough packing material? Are you? Is this approved to, to ship this game like this? Um, so, you know, I would say kudos to, and that's probably one of the best experiences I had with each of these um, fulfillment companies, is they all take it very, very seriously of making sure that the end consumer is not getting a game or the corners are dented because some career guys just toss the box or whatever. So uh, rest assured, if you use any of them, your game's going to get there safe. Um, in terms of storage, though. Um, as I said, you can store them literally anywhere. It doesn't pick a pack. Your question was, what's the plan going forward? Um, so what we want to do is make sure uh, once all the fulfillment was done, that was uh, literally my entire focus for the past several weeks. And my promise, quite frankly, on our page was that all of our fulfillment would be done before we start approaching retail, to be fair. Um, now we're going through the process of reaching out to uh, game distributors as well as uh, retailers to see if we can get some listings at some of these retailers with the game. So that's the intent of that inventory that we have remaining is to actually sell in large quantities to retailers. Okay, so you're not like doing like ticky tack, like one at a time. Like no. if someone wanted to like go to your website or go on, M or how does it work? Like if someone, cause I think you can go on Amazon yeah, they could. And they want with like with fulfill right or something like that. And I guess, how does, how does that work? Like if someone, so I guess if you could take the time, explain what happens, how it gets from you to a distributor to a friendly local game store versus online if someone wanted to get it. What would that look like? And is that going to be possible? Yeah, it's all possible. And, and full disclosure, we're still building this out, right? So we're still learning this industry. And, uh, you know, maybe there'll be a round three in, uh, in another yeah. year on this and we'll, we'll share three, the more and five. But <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So... Um, Again, I use a freight forwarder. Uh, I never just call up a courier company to ship anything anywhere. Um, so to get it from um, the, the warehouse, so if I was gonna ship it to, uh, for instance, say 401 Games in Toronto, right? So they're, uh, they're gonna carry the game. So if to send the inventory there, in this case, Snakes and Lattes is acting both as a fulfillment center for Kickstarter, but they're also acting as a, as a pick and pack facility for us. They're storing the games, when I need to say send, you know, three, um, uh, you know, three cases of uh, of uh, text me no thanks over to uh, 401 Games, I send them the uh, the order. They put the bag together, the packing slips. They ship it. They send you an invoice for the the picking fees, which still charge like a buck fifty or whatever every time they pick a game, uh, plus the shipping costs. And they'll put enough charge on those shipping costs, and they'll ship it to where it needs to go. 
um, those retailers that are, it's up to them to sell it, that the price they're going to sell that. Now, if you want to sell online, um, one thing I committed both the retailers as well as uh, the people that, uh, that, you know, is honored to, to have back me is we never want to undercut ourselves, right? So right now I've got listed on Amazon. I have an Amazon account um, and it's on there at $50, right? That's the Canadian. That's, that's the manufacturer you know, recommended price. Um, I will never go below, even if 401 games or snakes and lattes or one of these other guys, tic tac on Instagram, much like that. <laughs> um, any of, uh, if, you know, if any of these guys want to retail online, you know, they're going to retail at the price they're going to retail it at. And if they drop it down to say $40, I'm not going to match. I'm going to leave my price at 50. So, um, your fulfillment centers will cover off all that, including Amazon. So for instance, quartermaster is another good example in the States. There's two ways you can do Amazon. You can set up a uh, what's called a seller account where, where Amazon, you're actually storing your, uh, your product at Amazon in their warehouse. And then when they people will buy stuff through Amazon Prime, you get it within two days. There's a reason to get it within two days because it's actually in the Amazon warehouse. Hmm. That's going to work out to be about 24%. By the time they ship it, take their fees and everything, they're going to take about 24% off that retail cost. And the rest of that is your profits. Um, that fulfillment, if I wanted to ship that myself, so be listed on Amazon, but not in the Amazon warehouse, I could do that. And that would just send that Amazon order to Quartermaster, for instance, and then Quartermaster would then send, fulfill that uh, the Amazon order. So these um, Kickstarter fulfillment companies, most of them also act as ongoing fulfillment, pick pack, whether you want to plug in uh, a shopping cart on your own website, whether you want to plug in through like Amazon, for instance, um, or, or through someone else's, uh, someone else's site. Did that answer your question? Yeah. So I'm still trying to, uh, <laughs> figure out. So if you wanted to send to a distributor, right? Cause are you going to go straight to retailer or would you go to a distributor first? We're looking at both. So, um, I'm in the unique position that my day job is, I, I'm going to try to resize your head by the way, because it's okay. Hold on, sorry. You're getting squished. I'm Try too close to the camera. There we go. Yes. I'm getting excited. Better. I'm coming in close. Um, Talk about board yeah. games, baby. This is how, <laughs> it's exciting stuff. Yeah, it is exciting. So I think that, um, that there's two there's two approaches we're going to do. We're going to go through distributors to get to the smaller game shops, but we're 100% looking at going to, to retail as well. Um, I know that there's different schools of thought on that. And I've talked to some uh, people even recently that say, you know, they want to stick within the distributor ecosystem. Some distributors don't want you calling on retail because they're afraid you're going to undercut and so forth. Um, I think as long as you have that open discussion with the distributors to say, look, you know, you're more than welcome to sell to all these retailers, but there's a couple that we're approaching on the side. We're not going to undercut each other. So we're not going to, you know, uh, try to go in with lower price or try to give that retailer a, an advantage over say what you would sell it at. Um, but there's a big margin difference. Like a lot of these, these distributors will take like 60 points, um, of, uh, of, of margin. That that's, that's quite a bit. Um, you know, you could save 10, 20 points if you have the ability to distribute yourself, but it's a lot of work. And, um, and if you don't have the network, um, you're either going to larger retailers that uh, they buy it and they distribute to all their stores, uh, or you're going to be going with distributors that then can do the store by store game store, uh, selling, uh, selling of, you know, three, four units at a time. Yeah, we sold a lot yeah. at the recent breakout con as well. You sold a lot where? Did you lose me? No, no, no. I just didn't hear it. You said you sold a lot. Yeah. At breakout con. So in Canada, um, <coughs> a board game, um, uh, show, uh, which is for all all things board games that people love. It's, uh, it's a three day conference, and uh, yeah, so we had a table. Uh, that was about uh, almost a month ago now. Uh, we had a table at the show. Had people come and try the game, and uh, and uh, uh, the opportunity to buy if they wanted to buy at the show. So uh, we sold uh, quite a few units there. So we were pretty excited. So one thing that I, I found is when people try the game, that's when you're going to get most of your your, your pickup, right? So right, you got to get it in their hands. So, yeah, so let me. Let me crack the code. I don't think on the, the online, we probably will get into online advertising to push people to the Amazon page. Mm. Um, I'm sure there's people on, uh, on the group here that are 
Amazon experts, uh, and I'm what I probably call a novice. Um, from my experience, if you can, uh, my understanding of the algorithms, if you can send your, um, if you can send consumers to the Amazon page from outside, so through say Google ads, for example, that's going to trigger more of a, an algorithm uh, of pushing your game forward on Amazon than if you're just doing Amazon ads. Amazon doesn't necessarily prioritize internal advertising, which seems strange to me, but uh, yeah, that's we tested that's on a weird. product and it works, so. So since we were just talking about uh, numbers and retailers and distributors, let me uh, let me <laughs> run some because it, it's all very confusing, right? So James Matthew had a post. Uh, I think this was recently, <coughs> and let me just sum it up because I thought this was really good. Yep. And I, I jotted down the key notes here. So it says retailers tend to charge double the price they paid for a game. Keystone pricing. Margin is a percent the retailer makes selling a game, so typically 50%. So let's stop right there. So if it's a $50 MSRP, that means that you would sell it to a retailer for $25. Does that sound about right? Yeah. I would try so, to sell for less. I would try to sell for 40 but um, like a 40% markup. But uh, from what I'm... So, so you would try to sell it... You would... You would try to sell it for more than twenty five, like you'd try to sell for like thirty or something. Yeah. So okay, so so fifty percent tops. Gross profit, basically. What's that? So fifty percent tops, right? Like for a retailer, yeah. you you don't you want to maybe somewhere between forty and fifty percent. Yeah. And then for a distributor, it says that they like to pay forty percent of MSRP. So. You were saying that they were. Is that is that pretty much what you were talking about? Like sixty percent off. Like that's what they're. Yeah. So um, yeah, the way the math works is that the distributor will buy it at like sixty, a minimum of sixty percent off, mm -hmm. and uh, and then they will put the uh, retailer's margin in their in their sixty points. So they're net netting somewhere between ten and fifteen percent net. Gotcha. Or distributor. Right. Yeah. And so and so, what you can save if you don't go through a distributor is at ten to fifteen percent, right? It's yeah. pretty significant, especially on a, a large, uh, you know, bigger game, a $50 game. It's, yeah. You know. Yeah, um, but there's some benefits too. And again, I don't want to kind of flip-flop back and forth here. It depends on where somebody is in the, um, you know, their comfort level of, of doing the grind, right? Um, right. Your distributors, for the most part, are going to actually ship the product to those locations. And they're going to cover mm -hmm. that in that in that nut. And... Um, there's going to be efficiency. So if they're shipping a case of games to X, Y, Z game store and in that box, three units are, are your game. Um, that's going to be way cheaper than you trying to ship those three units on their own to that store. Right. So there's going to be some economies there that uh, you'll realize. So you have to find the method that works best for you. Um, from my experience, it is a, uh, there's a lot of, um, unanswered phone calls, a lot of unanswered emails. Um, you know, this has been a huge, huge learning for me uh, and we're still trying to crack through. Um, but it's a pretty tight um, uh, group amongst the distributors to actually get in there and get somebody to take the game is, uh, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to call up six distributors and they're all going to carry my game. Like it's, 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 it's a lot of work to try to sell the retailers on your game and why they would carry it and why they think they can make money on it and so forth. So, um, you can sit back and try to wait until you have that figured out. Um, or you can be hitting retailers yourself and at the same time to work the distributor angle. Um, so that when those two things click, you're not just you know, sitting around waiting. Right. So and that's the approach that, that we've taken that, um, you know, my day job, I have relationships already with some of the uh, larger retailers across Canada. Um, so, we have the experience of how to get in, in, in the back door and, and, and talk to the right people. Um, you know, when I reached out to, and I don't want to uh, uh, shame them, so I'm going to say uh, two different uh, companies, retailers, where I went to a store, the store's like, I love the idea, you have to call the head office, here's a number, here's the email, reach out to them. You call the head office, head office says, oh, sounds great, send us an email to customer service at blah, 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 and if someone's interested, they'll give you a call back. That's just going to go right in the shredder. No one's no yeah. one's calling you back, right? So, um, 
you have to find a way to get to the right decision makers, whether maybe you're uh, in LinkedIn, you know, there's different uh, tools. Weasel your to way in well. somehow. Yeah. But you've got to be, uh, you got to be aggressive and you got to, you got to chase it. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like everything you're talking about takes a lot of uh, ingenuity and just persistence. A lot of, it's a lot of work. It's a grind. It's a grind. One of the things I think that's important in communities like this is, is sharing, um, sharing not just knowledge, but even contacts, right? So mm -hmm. once we break through on some of these, then the second wave is always easier, right? Right. It's less so then in case you have a colleague that says, hey, I got a game I'm trying to get in, you know, then hopefully you pay it forward and say, well, here, let me see if I can broker an introduction. Maybe I can, you know, help, uh, you know, help make that, that connection with that particular retailer. So, um, you know, I've been quite pleased with, how cool the uh, the community of at least of game developers and publishers are everyone seems really interested in trying to help each other out um mm -hmm. i pay for it as much as i can other people are giving me advice so again i'll, I'll give another plug plug to a mike mccray from analog studios uh had a great chat with him even yesterday and we're just swapping ideas back and forth and different things that i find are working um and and stuff that uh, he that he's finding working and put me in contact with some of his people too so I think the more we can do that as a community, uh, the, the better it'll be for all of us. Yeah, agreed. So well, you said you said you had some uh, some tips for uh, what you would do, or yeah. what maybe what you would do differently, or advice that you would give. And actually, I the, remember last time we had, or not last time, but one time that we had talked, you said that you weren't even sure about the whole Kickstarter process, whether you would uh, do it again going forward. So yeah. let's speak on that and give the tips and. Just, Give us all, download all that info into our heads so we don't have to go through the, any problems that you went through. Or we have an easier time, at least. <laughs> uh, you, and the best learning is from other people's mistakes, for sure. One thing that um, uh, I had, I uh, read a lot of blogs um, on, um, especially shipping around the globe. And um, one of the things I'm glad I read before I got started was that you have to prepare the fact that there's going to be taxes and there's going to be customs and duties like VAT taxes. That, that yeah. Sort of thing. So like the UK is like 15%. You got to plan for 15% of the cost of your goods. You're paying as soon as that, that, that ship lands at port. Right. Same thing in Canada, Canada, by the time you work out your duties, uh, you're probably in around 15% as well, duties and taxes. Um, we have a free trade agreement, at least for now between the States and Canada. So if you're paying into one country, you don't have to pay again into the other country. So that's, that's a benefit between uh, Canada and the U.S. Um, but that's one thing I'd say people should plan for. Excuse me. I think another thing is <coughs> shipping costs, too. Um, really make sure not just that you're planning for um, your shipping costs on your fulfillment side, um, but you also plan your shipping costs of getting it to port. And uh, like the cost of, you know, with this freight forward or bringing it from China to North America. Um, that can be a surprise to some people. Um, and, uh, in the length of time, you're looking at six weeks, the cheapest is going to be by boat. So you're looking at six weeks to get, uh, to get your product, uh, landed in North America. And, um, so just try to account for that. I would plan, I mean, it depends on the cost of your game and, and, and the size and weight and so forth, but maybe 15% I would allocate just to be safe for shipping costs of getting your stuff from the manufacturer, include shipping and duties, for instance, to get from the manufacturer to your uh, fulfillment center. So those are not the, even, not even shipping to the actual end customer, just getting it to your continent. That's correct. I got a cold. I apologize. I have to keep oh, yeah. it's a, intermittent white. By the way. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's only include getting it to the consumers. So most Kickstarter campaigns have some include shipping. Uh, mine didn't. Mine said, Hey, we're going to, uh, we'll send out the survey at the end. I have to do the billing on the shipping. Um, and then those rates, uh, once you land on your different fulfillment centers, so choose who is going to fulfill your game before you even launch your campaign. They'll give you an idea what your shipping rates are um, uh, to actually build in. So for most countries, it works out to be between 10 and $15 local currency. So wait, when you say that you didn't include shipping, I noticed a lot of times on a Kickstarter campaign, uh, it'll it'll have different shippings. Like as you try to pledge, it'll say like, are you U.S.? Are you Australia? Whatever, and it'll have like plus six shipping or plus ten dollars shipping. Did yours have that, or did you no. just have like a little disclaimer saying there will be shipping? Yeah, and so we'll let you know later. My and I think this is what I would one of the things that I probably 
do different. And then Eric, just answer your question, Eric, on the uh, shipping insurance, your freight forwarder will usually have that included as part of that shipping. So I see Eric just asked a question about uh, your shipping insurance, some reports. So that's usually your freight, that's covered under your freight forwarder. Uh, the, uh, it's usually, yeah, 10 to $15 uh, local currency. Um, so what I did is I had that note saying, here's the grid of what you can expect by country for shipping. Um, my feeling at the time was that if I could keep the pledge amount as low as possible, you'll have more people coming in. And then with the added costs, it's, it's you're already committed at that point. So then, you know, several weeks later when it's, it's ready and you get your survey and then you have to pay your extra $10 for shipping or $15, it wouldn't be as big of a deal as asking somebody to pledge $40 plus the 15 right now. Um, did, did anybody balk once it came time? And it's like, oh, shipping? I didn't know, even though you told them. Um, actually, uh, yeah, uh, more so because there was, there was actually an error in our sheet uh, mm. with um, uh, Australia. It's one of those things where you're copy pasting down your spreadsheet, upload it to the fulfiller, uh, fulfiller posts the rates, and the Australians were like, "Whoa, these rates are like way higher than than what you had uh, had said in the sheet." You know, I don't want to complain. And us. right away, guys, it's going to get corrected immediately. You have my commitment. I said this is what your shipping rate is going to be. Your shipping rate is going to be what I committed to. My apologies. So we we owned it and uh, and got that uh, that mistake rectified right away. But no, no one really pushed back on it. There was a lot of confusion. So this is where I want to lead into the pledge managers. I don't know if I would use a pledge manager again next time. Who did you use last and, time? No. Or do you not yeah, want to throw any shade? I don't want to. I don't want to. Okay, okay. I don't you wanna, used I'm not here to a ask pledge anybody. manager, a a major pledge manager. There, there, say. there's a couple out there. They all, but my understanding is they all work the same. Um. If I would use a pledge manager, if you have a very complicated uh, Kickstarter, so if you have a lot of upgrades, you know, uh, you pay forty dollars, we give us an extra five bucks, and we're going to send you, you know, six more pieces, and then you're right. Like I think of like Tiny Epic, like they they have like you could get like a play mat, and you can get like upgraded pieces, and yeah. you know all these things. So you're saying something like that, something like that. upsells, it, it could end up paying for itself, right? Yeah, pledge manager because it takes away a lot of the complexity. Um, for me, I found, especially with family and friends, there was a lot of confusion because the pledge manager wasn't super clear and there wasn't the ability to correct it. And we kind of spotted this going in saying, hey, you know, this language of this is, I think it's going to confuse some people. I think people are going to be saying, wait a second, do I have to repay for the game or am I paying for just a shipping? Like it wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, well, it's our program and we can't change it. And lo and behold, I had at least 20 people come back saying, I'm confused. I'm confused. Yeah. Even for things like local pickup, uh, wasn't a function that was necessarily built into those pledge managers as a, as a default. So, you know, friends and family, you're not going to ship it to them. You're probably going to go and, you know, drop them at a certain location, go say, thank you. Um, you know, we had these, um, extra little things. Or I think I sent one to you, Bobby, the, uh, the robot uh, as a little thank you to, you know, our, our close friends and family. Right. So we want to hand that and say, here, you know, here's, here's the game. Thank you so much for, for backing me it was very confusing for them with the pledge manager. So I don't know my philosophy on, um, on Kickstarter is to answer your question. Well, I'll do another one. I think I probably will actually now that I've gone through it um, is I'm still at the philosophy of it's better to have stretch targets apply to everybody. So if I hit this level, this is what everybody gets. If you get one more level, everybody gets that, that additional uh, stretch target. It just yeah. makes the logistics side so much cleaner on on the other end so that was my belief just from again my day job uh simpler is better and um so in that case you don't necessarily need to use a pledge manager and you can save yourself a, a few points of uh of, of margin having to to give up so um, what was the what were the issues that made you initially a little down on kickstarter and kind of make you second guess it like right post campaign yeah, you know, and I think this is, I, I think anybody goes through this and a lot of people I've, I've, uh, I've read a lot of blogs and every single one of them says the same thing. Get ready for the emotional roller coaster. It's like a burnout <laughs> kind of. Oh yeah. It's, uh, you're on it every single day, all day, um, clear your calendar. At least that, like it's, you are babysitting this thing like crazy. And, and so wait, uh, uh, remind me, cause I think, was it just you, uh, or do you have partners on the game? So I have uh, I have myself, and then I've got uh, some family members that are they're helping with it as well. But so is, it, my, is it primarily you, or is it uh, split 
significantly over over several people because that makes a big difference yeah it's primarily me and then some helpers yeah gotcha okay because if someone had a partner or let's say two partners you know doing one third of the work probably makes a huge difference and just having someone to like kind of bounce stuff off of and talk with that sort of thing yeah so that and that's more kind of my my group is more the kind of the advisory team Mm -hmm. but have somebody actually share the legwork um yeah there's a lot there's no doubt there's a lot of benefits to that you're you're splitting the you know the proceeds as well but um there's still uh there's a lot of benefits if you can go with uh, a number of people um but yeah, babysit this thing like crazy so i think when i was coming out of it um for me um you know i was processing a lot of the learning and a lot of the frustrations the pledge managers and so forth now that i've had some time away from it looking back um I, I know what I would do differently going forward, which I've talked a lot of them over the past hour <laughs> with you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the types of games is, uh, is important too, right? So I think from my experience in talking with uh, various uh, developers, a game like Tanks But No Thanks, um, I'm not sure it's, it's the right fit for a Kickstarter. Um, Kickstarter is very good for any kind of fantasy type games anything with mm, miniatures miniatures yeah card games we'll see i got a card game i'm working on that uh we'll see um Me too. <laughs> and you'll see we'll also reverse. see and then i'm gonna do reverse i'm gonna like interview you on my page yeah yeah you all, your, all your learnings um i think um i think the game really is is, is a big uh, is a big piece of that so um you know, but we stayed true to what we created we didn't want to go too far off of the core of our game um we had a lot of great uh some really cool stories. Like one that we had was um, a local school uh, where uh, my wife works. Um, they have a, a learning center, and in the learning center, they said, "Hey, you know, we're looking. Would you mind coming and bringing bringing your game and, and showing the kids how to play?" And I said, "Of course, you know, let's go." And so these are kids that have um, you know some learning challenges and uh, are in some cases from homes that um, are underprivileged. And uh, you know, it was a very impactful day going through that. And we. I just left copies, right? So keep it for the class. Kids loved it. And there are some kids that, um, that they like. So we, we actually gave it to some of the, the individual kids. And they're still running tournaments at the school. So some of these oh, tournaments the game are still oh, putting wow. the, like little sign up sheets and, uh, you know, saying, oh, I'll see you. I'll see you at recess on the battlefield. And I mean, it, so when you hear these stories and, and hear how you're impacting um, people, it, it brings a lot of joy. And I think it must be so cool to think that there's a tournament scene for your game that yeah. like that you made on a like a cookie cutter board like 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah I never would have thought back when I made it. Um, and again, the little robot we have behind me there, um, we had that as the the trophy, right? So the winner of the tournament got like a little a little tin robot. Um, you know, one of the kids was talking about how he's now started working on his own little board games, had some ideas and some board games he can make. And you know, when you can inspire other people, I think that's why most of us do it. Um, I don't know any of the developers I've talked to that have said, you know, they plan to get rich from making a board game. Most people are doing this because they love it. And uh, it brings them a lot of personal joy. Seeing someone else having fun with something you created uh, yeah. is, is such a cool... Uh, Scratch such a cool that creative game. itch. Yeah. yeah. For me, that that's a big reason why I wanted to come out with the game too. I just wanted to go through the process. And I know a lot of the people in the group uh, either want to make their own game or... or or in some, pro- some part of the process. And so if I could go through and just survive it and then, you know, make some videos, maybe like put together some like, I don't know, blog posts or eBooks or something like that, then, uh, you know, that, that's something that could be really cool to help other people actually bring their ideas to life that people who probably are much more creative than me, but they get into all this stuff, this logistics stuff that you talk about. And I know a lot of creative people that just aren't good at like logistics or business kind of kind of things. So that's that's something that I'm excited to uh, you know in the future help people out with once you know once, once I'm done actually getting a game out. Well, I think this group um, has been pretty good too. Like as I was saying before the um, before so I haven't got to my tips yet. I'll get to some of these tips in a second. But uh, I, you know what really attracts me to the board game club is is the positivity across all the members uh it really totally. is such a great group of people um everybody is everyone else's cheerleaders you see a lot of people posting things from their personal lives 
uh, it is just an absolute joy. And I've been part of other uh, groups um, where you don't have that. You have trolls and you have people who are very negative and they bring their negative to to an environment like that. And, and so far, the board game club has been free of all that, which has been amazing. I found that in meetup groups as well. Meetup groups is a great way to trial your game. Um, I joined a lot of meetup groups in and around the Toronto area uh, to get going out to game night, having people try uh, tanks but no thanks. And um, my experience there is I've got one, the, uh, the board game, um, New Market Board Game Group. Shout out to that group. Fantastic group of people. I think their membership now is up to 80 people, 80 members. It's, it's, nice. fairly, it's fairly robust. Um, all really, really nice, genuine, great people. I've been to other meetup groups where it, it's, it's not so much, right? So mm -hmm. I think you get that, um, that spectrum, and you just need to find out what you're looking for and then plug into that and try not to get discouraged if you end up plugging into the wrong stream where you're not with the yeah. same people, and, and you know, that can be very discouraging. You got to unplug from that and try to plug into one that, that, that works for you. Yeah, I've definitely got some uh, some of the groups where I ask a question and people just get all bent out of shape. Like, how, how could you even ask this? Or, or, you know, people just overly correcting, overly critical, instead of the vibe of just, you know, trying to help. But like my experience has been, like you said, by and large, people are mostly extremely helpful with their time and, you know, message you like everybody responds almost pretty much so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's been really ah. good. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is getting a uh, pretty, pretty late here. So what, let, let's get to your tips. I keep no cutting problem. you off. Right. You could, uh, Let me throw about <laughs> uh, five things out here. I apologize. I know we talk. All right. It goes on forever. All right. One. Number five. Let, let's start at the worst tip. So, one, <laughs> so prototyping for, um, for cards, if you're doing a card game, hmm. make playing cards.com. It's the cheapest, highest quality one I've found. Uh, it takes less than a week to get your prototype back. So from when you hit go, uh, usually within five or six days, you have your game in your hands. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, video. If anybody's looking to create like a video for their um, Kickstarter campaign, I've seen someone where well, there's somebody just sitting in a chair and they're talking about their game. Mm -hmm. Those campaigns don't usually have a lot of, like it's not exciting, right? So if you want to create something that's exciting, but you don't want to spend a lot of money, um, uh, storyblocks.com. I used that when we did the... Um, and I'll, I'll put all these as, as a comments too, so you don't have to write them all down. Yeah, yeah. I'm writing them down too. Storyblocks. So storyblocks. What, what is that? It is um, uh, stock video that's like 15 seconds long. So you type in a, a topic, people jumping or, or explosion. So, or so it's case, sort of like, uh, like, like stock images you would get from, from stockphoto.com except video. Yeah, clips. or like Shutterstock, but cheaper. Shutterstock. Way it. cheaper. So I think their, their package is, I looked up before, I think $40 for a month, uh, and you get unlimited uh, downloads. Huh. So basically, if you wanted to just make your video, it, it costs you $40 for unlimited stock footage. Bingo. And you use this for your game? For, yep. uh exactly what I did. So I went into your that. Video? Well, I created that one and I had that like starts off. There's like this situation room and one general comes in. The guy says, you know, yes for me, general. And he says, yes, you know, we are about to start this war on all these different fronts. And then it shows, you know, clips of my game, but the inter interconnected with clips of like tanks shooting at other tanks and moving and rolling and so forth. Um, all that I got from, from Storyblocks. Uh, iMovie. Uh, so if you have a Mac or if, uh, if you have a PC, I don't know what the equivalent would be on a PC, but iMovie on a Mac is – amazing for doing simple videos it's amazing uh your kids can do it how supposed to do videos on that so you can import some of these story block uh clips if you want to use that service for instance mm. full disclosure i don't get anything out of this i'm just mm. right there um you can do that in iMovie and you can do that fairly quick i um, drop in some transitions and it looks yep. professional exactly um i mean in one case i have like a tank shoots and then all of a sudden it says you know you have to destroy the person's tank so it shows an actual tank shoot Next scene shows like this whole battlefield and then you see one of my tanks actually on the battlefield and then that thing actually explodes. And that was as simple as taking just a picture of my tank with a transparent background and put it as an overlay on the, on the screen. So there's really simple things you can do to create uh, a slick video. Um, voiceovers, uh, Fiverr.com. Yes, is Fiverr. It? Love Fiverr. Fiverr's great. The tip I would give on this, because I ran into this on voiceovers, is you're starting to see the rates creep up on Fiverr. So back five years ago, it was literally $5. Now it could be in the hundreds of dollars if you want somebody to do something. There's a lot of professional voiceover. People have actually put them in there. And then when you have all the, okay, now you need the commercial rights, you need this and this and this, 
the rates go up. Sort by uh, newest um, um, uh, Fiverr members. So you type what you're looking for voiceover, but then sort by whoever's joined Fiverr uh, the soonest, because that'll give you people that are just starting into voiceovers. People are just starting to try to build their portfolio. Those people, right. it's going to be like 20 bucks, right? So mm -hmm. again, I had a professional voiceover. Pay the 20 bucks, get professional voiceover to do it because some of them have proper equipment. It won't sound tinny. It'll sound good. Uh, you know, the guy I used actually was great. He could do different characters' voices. So same person did all the voices in the video. Uh, it was great. Um, as I said, iMovie to put it all together. If you're doing a, a news release, EIN News is a, uh, is a PR newswire um, service. When you sign up for the first time, you get a free news release. You don't have to pay anything. After that, I think it's like 50 bucks per news release, which is way cheaper than the competitors. And what they'll do is you'll fill out your, your, your news release. You put in links to your, um, uh, to, your, to your game or your Kickstarter page. You can put in actual images, you know, uh, B-roll images of your, of your board game and so forth. Um, everything that's, that's clickable that people can use, that actually gets blasted out to all the media outlets, um, you know, and you pick the different markets, to say around North America or into Europe. I think we picked up something like 4 million impressions just off that one news release. Um, I think there was at least four different websites and news websites that actually picked up the article and then they put it on their website. So many people don't realize that news isn't necessarily done the way it was in the old days where you actually have a reporter go out and write a story. 98% of all news is a newswire sends out uh, pre-written articles and then these news channels will go and they'll just pick what's interesting and they'll download it and then they'll put it into their paper and maybe make a couple of little tweaks and that's what ends up in your local paper. Um, and so what was that site? E-I-N-F? Yeah, E-I-N News. E-I-N I'll, I'll put the link to this. News. So yeah, so you'll find a lot of online. So I actually had some game sites that uh, were doing blogs and they took my article. Well, they might take all of it. They might take, take part of it. But there's some that actually put the full article in, which is really cool. And so you think you got some pledges out of it? I don't know if I got pledges. I It's tough to say. Like, you, you never know. You have some kind of cookie that can link. I can certainly say I got exposure out of it because um, you get a report at the end that says, here's exactly how many um, places this showed up. Uh, here's how many impressions you had. So how many times it actually showed up in front of somebody's eyeballs, things like that. Nice. Um, and again, it's free for your first time sign up. So anything that's free is good. Why not? Yeah. That was my, current, my encouragement for Kickstarter is do as much as you can free. You're going to be bombarded with people. As soon as you launch, you're going to get at least 10 emails from people saying, hey, I'm so excited. I'm going to, I'm going to pledge for your website. And while you hire me, I can help you X number of uh, people look at this. I'm going to put you on all these super backer sites and so forth. I did one of those. I think I got two incremental pledges out of that. Uh, so for the cost, I don't know if it's worth it. I think you're better to build up your campaign ahead of time like you're doing and, uh, and get people excited about the creation of the game before you launch it. You'll get much more legs out of that. Uh, Gleam.io, I think I told you this last time we were on our call. Yep. Gleam.io is an app. I think it's actually free uh, if you're just doing Facebook and Twitter plugins. Um, it, uh, I think it works out to be like 30 bucks a month, maybe, or something like this, if you want to have it actually plug into Kickstarter. But what it mm -hmm. does, it allows you to run contests. So this is where I got the most uh, pickup on my Twitter feed uh, and my Facebook feed. So what the contest does, <laughs> yeah, I'm giving away a free game. I'm giving away three free games. Um, you set what regions uh, this goes out to. You link into different contest sites. And then those people, when they, if they want to enter to win your game, they have to do a number of actions. One could be uh, like you on Twitter. One could be share with five friends. Another could be like you on Facebook. So it helps you drive up your social numbers uh, quite rapidly. The money I put into building my Twitter feed, um, but I, I was able for a fraction of that to double my, uh, my audience in like two days using this, uh, this Gleam app. So it was, uh, it was significant. Um, I've used on other products and industries. It seems to work well with games. I think it works when you have physical like things, stuff you can give to people. Uh, it seems to be where it works well, but that's something I recommend to people as well. Um, and then lastly, I would say that again, do a lot of searching on, uh, on, on YouTube and, and Google. There's a lot of review uh, groups out there looking to build up their audiences. Um, right would be willing to do like a, a box opening or do uh, a walkthrough of your game uh, simply just for a free copy. Uh, so I'd encourage people to do that. The one thing I would say if you're going to do that is I would ask, what is your audience right now? Uh, Cause you're going to have people have like an audience of five. They're going to reach out to you. Um, mm -hmm. And then two, 
if it's a multiplayer game, are you going to play this with other people on camera? Or are you just yourself going to explain how this works? And that's okay once or twice, but there's some people that will just do like a one man, like they'll play, like I had one person that did, and again, I really appreciate the uh, the review, but they did a play, play through by themselves with, with the with the four things. So it's good to explain how the game worked, but you don't have the energy that comes with uh, taking out your opponent and, and, and shoot your best friend and taking them off the board, right? So right. Um, that would be my only my only advice on that. Thanks for your time. <laughs> so here we go. James Staley's top five. Last thing oh. I want to say is we have a game behind me here of tanks, but no thanks. I noticed you haven't given away a game on your uh, on your, uh, your page. Yeah, it's been I've been too busy trying to trying to get my game going. I haven't even thought about uh, giving games away. Oh. But go ahead. So I wanted to figure out a way we can give away this game where we can also um, obviously have exposure on the board game club. But I want to start getting some of my my YouTube channel numbers up if possible or Twitter channels. Would that be cool if we can work out something maybe off camera? We'll figure out a way to do that. But I'd love yeah. to uh, give away another copy of. Right. It's been that. it's been too long. Let, let's do it. And uh, and thanks for uh, to Thomas who won the last contest. I know uh, he still uh, sends me feedback, high fives me, and uh, I definitely appreciate uh, you know, all the uh, you know all the love coming this way. So Thomas Thomas the Danish wonder, <laughs> he, he would be my favorite member of the board game club if he just shut up about flux. He's always giving me <laughs> shit about flux because I hate flux. And, uh, but that's all right. It's all in good fun. We all have um, our favorites. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So before we sign off, uh, you, you mentioned you wanted to ask about, uh, the oh, yes. game yes, where sorry. I'm at. So, so I just, I just did a, a post this week, uh, for the name, um, you know, cause we were calling it disaster sort of, um, just kind of like informally, like, you know what, we should probably come up with a, an actual name so that we could get the board game geek, uh, you know, entry. And so we could actually get a URL and all that stuff. Um, so put the, I put a bunch of options out there and by far, uh, this game is a disaster was, was the best one, which was not my favorite. I was really hoping for disaster get in. I thought that sounded so cool, but, uh, you know, it just shows that you don't know, you don't know what people like. You just gotta find out. Uh, and people seem to like pun names like tanks, but no thanks pun name. Yeah, uh, I think of games like Broom Service and you know a bunch of bunch of those. So they do well. So I I'm think I'm guessing that the board game club and the people on the email list they they probably know better. So so we decided to go with it. This game is a disaster. And then if it sucks, then it's like well you know we we told you it was the name of the game. We told you it was a disaster, <laughs> and you bought it anyway. You so, guys did you know, this. <laughs> it's your own fault. Yeah. So. Uh, so anyway, that happened recently. We got uh, almost all the artwork. I think we have like locked down now. It's not. Have you locked? Have you started uh, seeing if there's like uh, your URL available or? Got the URL. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, and uh, the the only thing I wasn't sure of is if I should do the hyphenate. Like, is it not hyphenated but uh, apostrophe? This game's a disaster, or this game is a disaster. So I just got this game is a disaster, just because I figured. The apostrophe might screw up sometimes when you're typing it in, I don't know, URLs or links or something. You know, like I was like, we'll just make it clean. This game. Yeah, is that was one thing I wish we should have thought through more on tanks, but no thanks. Uh, we've got an exclamation mark. We've got a comma in there. It is brutal uh, with searchability. Uh, I bet you, you, like just things you don't, you could never predict ahead of time. And then it just comes up no. when you're trying to sign it up to some sort of site and the, there's an error, you know, like you try to submit and then there's a little asterisk saying no. invalid characters, whatever. So figured, forget about that. We'll just, we'll just design that right out of the game. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, so have a little bit more artwork. I'd say like four, five. Uh, I posted something today looking for some feedback. Oh, like, can you explain that? I was a little confused. So like it's a, it's a counter... You're calling it. How does how does that work? How does that work with the game? A counter in the game. Uh, what, what do you mean? Like how, the voice. Your card, you got to split, right? So is this a something that goes in the deck? That like mark. Okay, so when I say split, I just mean the artwork. So like, if this is the card, right? Like normally we just have like artwork, and then we're gonna have the text down here. And I'm just saying we're gonna do artwork. It's like three different pictures in the same mm. in the same card like three different scenes kind of split by you know like a little like zigzag border or something like that like so, i mean it, it's just it's all just one card it's just like 
you know, showing like little vignettes within the same, just to show different scenarios of heroes, which I don't know if it's a good idea. I guess it's the kind of thing people would have to see before you, uh, before you could really judge it or not. So I just kind of threw up my crappy little mock-up. I liked it. I liked the sketch. The sketch is cool. Yeah, that's what, that's what I've been doing. Just like little very crappy sketches. So I don't know. I'll see if uh, I guess so some good gonna, advice. There. How have you gone about your artwork? So I've noticed, like I've seen some of the artwork, which has been pretty fun and cool. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I can see uh, how people will, uh, you know, as we're playing, they'll be laughing at even some of the design. How did, how are you guys going about the design? How are you doing that? Is this something you're creating yourselves? Have you guys use like a third party or? No, using a third party for the artwork, it's it's pretty much me um, either mocking it up. I either do it in Photoshop, like I'll go and just grab a bunch of pictures of sort of what I'm looking for, and then uh, and then put it put it together and say do this, but make this a little brighter, this a little different. Or I'll do a really really bad uh, mock up, like I did, like I posted today, uh, and then I send it off, and then I usually get some feedback from one of the partners and you know which we do oh this this girl looks angry she should look surprised blah 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 um so i, I should i should put post more pictures because there are a lot of good pictures we're definitely going for a a horror comedy kind of vibe not or disaster comedy you know some funny some serious so um i'd like to get a little more humorous stuff in there uh, i just need to you know just be more creative about it maybe i could have hired someone to come up with ideas but you know it's a it's a humble campaign so we're just we're just doing what we can. So uh, you, so you guys are doing the design, or sorry, you're outsourcing. You kind of create what you're looking for, and then you send it to somebody else to kind of to do the actual oh, artwork. Is that what you're saying? Or well, got it. So yeah, so I'll design the art, but I won't actually draw the artwork. Like I'll do like the layout and what we want and like the vibe, and then we send it off to an artist to uh, to actually draw it and return the cards, like the ones that you've seen, the finished ones. How'd you find your um, artist? I uh, actually found him originally on Fiverr. It's funny you brought up Fiverr before. However, I did yeah. experience what yeah. he did where the, the rates creeped up. And, um, and uh, you know, I'm getting some, some like, generally good uh, results, but some kind of, like, it's taken a long time. Where originally it was supposed to be three days per piece. And uh, now it's, uh, you know, it, sometimes it's a few weeks before it gets back. Um, and also I've been, like... I noticed a lot of times if I sent him something that was, I photoshopped myself that I was sending him as an example. Sometimes I would notice he would just take the exact thing that I did and just sort of put filters over it and like change things. I'm like, and I had to like tell him like, no, 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 you can't just like, you have to redraw it. It has to be something <laughs> new because I'm yeah. stealing this from some site because I'm not selling it. I, I it was just for your eyes. Yeah. You can't because then it's actually stealing if I try to sell this. Oh, yeah. You know, so you do run into stuff like that when you're on a site like Fiverr. So you just got to be on top of it. Um, you know, and, and they're not charging $5 anymore. They're, no, they're not. It's, it's Our work is expensive. <laughs> the, the other game I was working on, same thing. I, I found an artist in Fiverr. But I had approached probably at least 20 artists, I would say. Yeah, maybe your example is the same thing. Trying to get the right, uh, somebody will do the right price. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's good advice. Make sure you say, Hey, uh, do I have, you know, can you quote this with the commercial rights? Um, so you don't have that, that price uh, creep in. And my experience with fiber on the, uh, audio side, very, very fast turnaround. Our work, same as you, I had some stuff that I thought I'd get back in like a week and three months later I, I got it back. So, um, you know, you have to have patience, uh, certainly if, uh, and that's the balance, I guess, right? If you're trying to cut costs, you can only push people so hard, especially if they're doing it at a, at a very low cost. Um, but at the same time, you want to kind of get your thing out. So people have got to be kind of aware yeah. of that. It's, well. a, it's that whole thing as a triangle of do you want quality, price, or <laughs> speed? Yeah. Pick two because you can't have them all. You yeah. can't have something that's good and fast. It, it'll be expensive and, you know, everything, everything has a cost. Yeah. Uh, so right now we're looking, we're trying to figure out graphic design, and uh, one of my partners uh, talked to someone about it. But it, if we were to use them, it would take some time, and I don't want to. Like I'm tired of waiting. It's already been like something like seven months, and it, this is a very simple game. It should not have taken this long. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm like kind of in the let's go, let's go, let's just like figure something out. Uh, mainly we need to figure out like the text, how it's going to look, and uh, the titles and the cards. 
and the the graphic on the back of the cards not thought about at all so definitely okay. need that need to get some uh some review copies to send to reviewers we got some people lined up and uh you know i just I just want to get moving i just want to just want to go i'm tired when, of this preparation stage when do you guys expect to be doing your kickstarter like when are you targeting like have you picked a target date as to like we got to be well i'd like to do it june 1st it's probably unrealistic but uh i like have an unrealistic goal because then you know at least you try to make it. Hopefully you get somewhere in the ballpark. Um, so we'll see. I'll have a chat with my partners and uh, and see if we could get everything done as quickly as possible and uh, get moving already. And are you guys looking to do a you know, pre-print is the plan before you hit Kickstarter? Are you going to do Kickstarter then print? Like where are you in that uh, I, I think we would do Kickstarter then print because we don't really know how many copies to get. You know, we don't, uh, I mean, that's something else we could talk about if we are confident enough, like you were confident enough yeah. with your game that, you know, you know, you're going to sell them at some point. And, you know, we, we just have no idea. We don't know if we'll sell a hundred copies, 500, 5,000, you know, like, I don't know. I have no idea. Probably somewhere closer to in the 100 to 500 than any sort of thousands, but you know, we'll have to see. So that's yeah. uh that's where we're at just gotta that's get exciting moving. that's yeah. that's a very short timeline <laughs> it's well i mean it's only short because it's already been like seven months yeah so, um but you know a lot of that has been just you know artwork and playtesting and things like that and we're kind of at the tail end of that so so for the reviewers or is it a print and play that you're doing or how how is that working i would like to send actual copies um you know using like the website that you uh that you recommended or some other one. Um, don't want to spend too much on it though. Like I don't think I'd want to spend $13 or uh, like that's what I looked at when I was looking at it today, $13. Even you said like 30, that's all too much for me to send to a reviewer. Sure. So if I could, if I can get that closer to like five to $10 or otherwise I would probably just go print and play route. No, nothing you can do in terms of um, uh, with that site, which I just discovered today is when you create your account and you upload your artwork, um, you could actually then have other people if they want to buy like an early test version of the game where they want to say, okay, you know, so you've got friends or extended family that are not in the same city as you. And they're like, yeah, you know, I'd love to try it and, you know, you know, have the tangible feel of it. They could actually go on the site and order uh, a deck and pay for one deck based on your artwork as well. Like you can send them the link and then they can pay. So that's one way that if, you have extended network that kind of wants to be part of the the process and they're not, you know, afraid to say, Hey, you know, I'll throw 20 bucks your way or 30 bucks your way to, to, you know, be part of the the first kind of exploratory of this. Yeah. Um, they could do that with that link and then it would just go straight to them. Right. Cut yourself out of it. Yeah. yeah that's a good idea. Proof of that. Cool. <laughs> that's yeah. exciting. I can't wait. I know I had the earlier print and play version, but uh, are, are, is there going to be a newer, updated one going out soon or yeah i mean the the print and play versions i'm sending out are pretty are pretty ugly it's like all uh, all temporary artwork it's not using any of the new art or actually maybe just like one card is in there that has the actual uh art but um yeah i think uh for the 2.0 whenever that comes out um i want to have the actual actual art that we're using um and uh, I don't know if we should do it in black and white or something like that, just so it's, you know, still gives people reason to buy the game. Or, uh, I mean, pretty much we just need to get the graphic design, the text layout figured out. And, you know, if I get if I get too impatient, maybe I'll just do it myself. Maybe I'm not a designer, but maybe I'll take a lynda.com course real quick and then figure it out and just boom, boom, boom. Let's, let's go. Let's move with this. You'd be amazed what you can do with... Um you know, so much software is, 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 is intuitive now. And, and there's endless amounts of YouTube videos that show you how to do certain things. Um, gosh, even as you know, like stock photography, right? If you do like a, a short term one month membership where you have unlimited downloads, I mean, you can sometimes create your own artwork that way and you have the rights to use that artwork because you've paid for that, that short term license. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I have, I, I'm confident in my technical skills. Like I'm good with Photoshop and video editing. It's just my actual design opinion, you know, like 
what is good design, what fonts look good yeah. together, that sort of thing. And that I have no confidence in of myself. So that's why. Yeah, I mean, that's just my weakness. Yeah. How many yeah. cards is there in your deck? So it's 60 cards. And then we're, we're playing with the idea now of including an extra few cards and actually just having uh, uh, the rules on the cards and Ooh. also like little player references too. So if we had six player references, because it's a six player max, and then let's say the rules were over two to four cards, then we're talking somewhere in the ballpark of 70 cards. So pretty, pretty small, pretty slim mm -hmm. deck. So we're looking to keep it pretty cheap. Yeah, so my $30 was for like 108 cards, right? So yeah, you should be getting, be able to get down to like $15 for, $15 to $20 for a... Uh, yeah, that's certainly more reasonable. That's something yeah. to think about, yeah. Oh, it's so exciting. I'm uh, I'm rooting for you guys. Uh, I've been following Thanks. as you've been going, and uh, I'll definitely be one of your first pleasures, I'm sure, when... All right. No, as much as... Look at that. We got one in the bag. Yeah, you got one. You count nice. on me for sure. And <laughs> uh, and again, thank you to uh, to the Board Game Club and, and you, Bobby, for all your support. Again, keep doing what you're doing, man. This group is uh, is awesome. And uh, again, uh, I keep uh, inviting people to it. And uh, I don't know if they get accepted, but I keep uh, telling people to, to, to join the group. And uh, I think if we all do that, we can keep growing this ecosystem. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for uh, being so giving and giving of your time, even though you're sick. And uh, Me through yeah, with next time, <laughs> next time, uh, you know, next time we'll do it at a time when you're you're in a little better a little better health sounds good i appreciate it all right thanks again for anybody right. that tuned in or anybody that watches this after the uh after the posting yep take all care right. talk to you soon cheers ciao